Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. I do not have a paper prepared, unlike my co-speakers, uh, so I'm just going to speak to you um, on the subject that I was asked to address, and I, I hope this is helpful, um, and if it isn't, please uh, stop me. Um, so, um, and I gather I have 10 minutes. I, I, I'm not known for my brevity, but anyway, we'll do our best. So, um, I have practiced in the area of uh, the application of the Eighth Amendment, and I understand that the committee would like an idea of the practicalities and how the courts balance rights in cases concerning the Eighth Amendment. Now, the long and the short of this is that on the substantive issue of the life of the mother versus the life of the fetus, if I could put it in those extremely crude terms, uh, that balance has already been struck by the Supreme Court in the X case. And that test uh, decided by the Supreme Court in 1992 is still the test that is applicable in any case where the right to life of the unborn uh, is in any way in conflict with the right to life of the mother. And the, the important thing to note about that provision is that all you are doing is you're balancing a life with a life. You're not balancing a life with health or welfare or, or, or any of those matters. You're balancing a life with a life. So the amendment specifically says these are equal rights. It is the equal right to life of the mother. So if you have two beings with equal rights to life, how do you balance that? And that's exactly what happened in the X case. And in the X case, what the argument before the court was, firstly, uh, the, the unborn has a right to life, the mother has a right to life, and you can only intervene to save the life of the mother, was the argument of the state, if the mother is facing a, a certain or inevitable death. So if she suffers from a condition that, that uh, will result in inevitably in death or imminent death, then you can intervene. But anything short of that did not permit an intervention. That was the argument made by the state. And in the High Court in X, the, the High Court judge said, yes, there is, a, there is a threat to the life of the young Ms. X, who was 14 at the time. But the threat to her life is nothing compared to the threat to the life of the fetus. Because if I don't grant the order, and the, and the High Court judge was asked to grant an order preventing Ms. X from travelling out of the jurisdiction to avail of an abortion, if the injunction was not granted, then there's a certainty that the fetus uh, will die, um, whereas it may or may not be the case that the mother would die. There isn't absolute certainty about her death. Now, the Supreme Court uh, looked at that test and decided that it, in fact, did not vindicate sufficiently the right to life of the mother. And in deciding how they would do that, they, they were first of all urged by counsel on behalf of uh, the young woman, that the real test was if there was a real and substantial amount of threat to her life, and not if there was an imminent certainty of her death, but a real and substantial threat to her life. And it didn't matter how that threat arose, whether it arose from kind of some kind of physical illness, or whether it arose from a threat of self-destruction. If that was a real and substantial threat, that was sufficient. And that was ultimately the test that the Supreme Court adopted, while making it clear that it was a threat to the life as distinct from the health of the mother. And how do they, how do, they do that? How do they decide um, that the life of the mother, um, uh, that the, the threat to the life of the mother was sufficient? And what they did was they looked at the Constitution as a whole, and they looked at the social function of women and girls. 
and the sort of constitutional rights that pertained. And they said it was important, and it, it's interesting when you look at the judgments, most of the judges regard themselves as harmonizing constitutional rights and not deciding on a priority of rights. And so they looked at the at, uh, girls and women and their interaction with other parties. This was a young woman who was there with her parents. She had a relationship with her parents. She had a relation. They had a relationship with her. She had a certain social functions. They took that into account. And I suppose it's very. I think it's it's most clearly explained in the McCarthy judgment, where he says the woman is the life in being. The uh, unborn is the contingent life, uh, and everything depends uh, uh, on the on the life of the woman in being. And you look at her role, and you look at her uh, function within society. And they decided that the test should be, uh, and it is, it is acknowledged in the McCarthy judgment that it's always going to be the case uh, that. There's going to be that the fetus would face certain death because the the choice is abortion or not abortion. So that is not the basis on which you approach the uh, the test. You look at the the substantive threat to the life of the mother. You evaluate that, and if there is a real and substantive threat to her life, then she is entitled to avail of abortion. Now. That is the only case that actually determines the test, where you have that kind of situation. But of course, the Eighth Amendment has arisen, and, and since then, there's actually a remarkable paucity of judgments um, concerning it. And nobody has, and it hasn't arisen, that anybody has brought a case before the court to look at that test again, because of course, the, the Supreme Court were saying no, no constitutional uh, interpretation is ever immutable for all time, but it just simply hasn't arisen. And so what you have is the application of that test and or a consideration of the right to travel. Because remember, when X was decided, there was no right to travel. And in fact, one of the discussions in X is not just, it's not just are you entitled to an injunction preventing this young, young woman from travelling. Are you entitled to an injunction at all on the basis of, you know, does she have a constitutional right um, and should her life be vindicated? And in those circumstances, is there a right to an injunction preventing her from availing of abortion services? That was the first question. But the second question was, can you actually grant an injunction against a person in these circumstances if they're simply going to travel to another jurisdiction to avail of a service that's lawful in the other jurisdiction? Now, the Supreme Court didn't come to a binding determination on that, on that point, but the majority indicated that their view would be that you could grant an injunction. Two of the judges took the view that you couldn't, and the, and the other three said that you could grant an injunction in those circumstances, but that was optional. So after the X case, there was, the, uh, there was a further referendum which introduced the whole um, right to travel um, as, a, as a, an independent right in the Constitution. So subsequent cases after X also looked at the right to travel aspect of it. Now, the other thing that you have to bear in mind about the case law is that... It, am I over my 10 minutes? No. I had uh, some technical difficulties starting up, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you have the Give benefit, the benefit of the doubt. You extra about, time. About three minutes. Like okay. Two, two and a half, three minutes, yeah. Most of the cases, indeed, the vast preponderance of the cases involve children. Um, the case law is about children ranging in age from about 13 and a half to 17. So you have the young woman in X who was 14. You have the C case, who was a young woman in care, age 13 and a half, who was suicidal. And the High Court determined that she satisfied the test in X, that there was a real and substantive threat to her life as a result uh, of, uh, of her reaction to the pregnancy. She had been, as is described in the report, brutally raped um, and as a result had become pregnant. She was considered to have satisfied the X test, but 
um, Mr Justice Gagan, in his judgment in the High Court, said if you're dealing with an Irish teenager who wants to travel abroad, that the uh, travel amendment didn't give an independent right to travel. Um, it was to prevent you from being injuncted from going abroad for, um, for an abortion, but it didn't allow an Irish court to uh, sanction you going abroad for an, for an abortion that you couldn't have got in Ireland, it is effectively what he says. Now, that case was not appealed to the Supreme Court because he actually found on the test that the young woman in question uh, satisfied the addicta in X uh, and there was no appeal by either parties to it. But that was, a claim, that was a case brought effectively by the HSE to ask the court what their rights and duties were in relation to this child. The last case then in that series is the Miss D case in which Miss D uh, claimed that she was not suicidal. She was a young woman in care, she was 17, and she was in circumstances where um, she, uh, her child was suffering from a fatal fetal abnormality um, and had a condition incompatible with life, and she wanted to travel to avail of an abortion. She was very clear that she was not suicidal. She was distraught at the diagnosis, but she was very clear that she was not suicidal. And she, um, uh, Mr. Justice McKechnie, in an, I think, a largely extempore decision in the High Court, decided that she had a right to travel. She didn't have to apply to the district court for liberty to, to go. Uh, and there was nothing in the statutes or the constitution that prevented her from traveling. Again, a child in care. So most of the case law that has arisen involves children, or it involves other women who do not have legal autonomy because they may be refugees or they may be in the immigration or asylum system. And those cases haven't actually come before the court as, as cases where there's a dispute about whether or not the mother's entitled to avail of services. They have come before the courts in other ways, and the court hasn't had to actually make a decision on the substantive issues uh, involved in the Eighth Amendment. I don't know whether that was helpful, but I've obviously I will answer any questions you may have in relation to it. Thank you very much.